The Chicago Bulls have a big test today in front of them tonight when they face off against the Brooklyn Nets in their first game for in-season tournament play. What are some of the keys to the games and how can the Bulls continue to rely on their defense while getting better offensively? We're going to talk about that today. We're also going to talk about Kobe White growing as a vocal leader for this team. And the Chicago Bulls adamantly state that they will not be trading Zach Levine, especially to the 76ers. But there is a but in there. We're going to get into all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host, Sarah Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, Let's go ahead and get into the content for today. And first up, the Bulls face off against the Brooklyn Nets today. And this is another game where the, the Bulls defense is going to have to be the thing that they rely on, but let's hope that they can shoot the ball a little bit better offensively. The balance with the offense and defense for the Chicago Bulls has really tipped in one direction, right? And typically, while we've had one game so far this season, of all the core three members of Vooch, DeMar, and Zach, all scoring 20 points and above, even then, it was an inefficient scoring night for most of those guys. The Bulls' offense has been completely lackluster so far in the young part of the season, and we have shot one of the worst percentages as a team so far, while averaging our points per game as far as averages isn't too bad, but we've just get gotten there really inefficiently. So we're going to need the team to really lock in offensively and to be a more efficient team, right? You don't even need, with the, with the brand of the Bulls defense uh, and, and that we've played it, you don't necessarily need a team that's going to average 120 points per game, right? You need a solid, efficient offense for the Chicago Bulls because the defense is legit. The Chicago Bulls defense is legit. And we've even seen it. We played the best defense so far in Luka. We've had really good uh, defensive performances uh, as a team, right? And we're really being active as a team defensively. You're getting everyone really involved, even DeMar DeRozan, who, you know, historically is a terrible defender, but he's been really active on the defensive side of the ball, even having games with multiple steals so far on the year. So the offense is about efficiency with the Bulls offense. It's not necessarily just about shooting more threes, even though, yes, some games we do lose to simple math and just do the fact that we aren't a high volume or efficient three-point shooting team. And you can't miss the wide open ones, right? That goes for Patrick Williams. That goes for Kobe White. That goes for everyone. You can't miss the open threes. We have to hit a higher percentage of our wide open threes. And there, and there, with the brand of defense that we play, we will be in more of these games. And so that's really something the Chicago Bulls need to focus on on the offensive side. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Yes, move the ball around. Move without the ball, right? Find the open guy. And, and, and then hit, ride the hot hand. Now, that's a Billy Donovan thing, right? One thing with Billy Donovan, he doesn't typically go with the hot hand. He, he always goes away from it in just weird and odd moments. So you want to see that improve from the coaching standpoint. But the, the players have to shoot the ball better as well. We have to shoot the ball better. We have to take advantage of mismatches, which we've done a little bit better in the last couple of games with uh, Nikola Vucevic. And that comes through Vuce being vocal about, hey, give me the ball. We're hearing Vuce call for the ball a lot more. And with this new contract, hey, listen, I'll say this. One of the things that have stood out so far on the Chicago Bulls season is that Nikola Vucevic's contract has not been an overpay, at least not yet. And I know a lot of Bulls fans that had questions, not all, about the contract that we signed Nikola Vucevic to. Vooch ain't the problem here. He's not the problem. Even, I will say this, even Vooch defensively now, he hasn't really faced a lot of big tests at the center uh, position yet so far in the season. But Nikola Vucevic has been no slouch defensively yet on the young part of the season. So, again, Bulls play solid team defense. Even though we don't have the greatest one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, on-ball defenders, the brand of team defense that the Chicago Bulls has played has been legit. And so the offense has to match that. We have to find a way to be efficient, right? We can worry about taking more threes. We can worry about other things once we find a way to be efficient. That's the key thing with this Bulls team is how are you going to be a more efficient offense? And if you can unlock that, right? And it comes through things that we've talked about, moving without the ball, hitting your open shots, moving the ball around, limiting turnovers, right? These are things that I know sound pretty simple and straightforward, but the Bulls just have not been able to do at a consistent level um, in, in games to be able to win it. Right now, the Chicago Bulls are, are 27th in the league in, in field goal shooting percentage. We have to shoot the ball better, period. We have to. That's not. So that's not an if, and, or but. Do we need to be the most efficient uh, shooting team in the league? No, I would love that, right? I would absolutely love that. But 
Right now, the Chicago Bulls sit at 42% shooting on the season. There are only three, two teams. I'm sorry. Yeah, two teams below the Chicago Bulls um, in, in that. That's the uh, Memphis Grizzlies that are shooting 42.1% and the New York Knicks that are shooting 40% from the field. We have to be a better, uh, a better shooting team. Just more solid. Make it respectable, right? And then the Chicago Bulls also, 28th in the league in three-point shooting. We're shooting 30% from three points so far this season. Only teams below us there are the Portland Trailblazers and the Charlotte Hornets. So we have to be more efficient. Again, I'm not even worried about the three-point attempts right now because we just haven't been we haven't been efficient in it. I would rather see less three-point shooting attempts, which we're averaging 31 uh, attempts per game, but we're only hitting nine and a half of those. We got to be more efficient in just in just shooting it at a better rate. Even if that means the 17 three-point shooting games where we only take 17 attempts. If you're hitting that at a six or seven percent, uh, or six or seven of those a game, that's solid. It's not amazing. It's solid, right? That's where we need the Chicago Bulls offense to be. But specifically in this game, the defense is going to be highly important for the Bulls as well. When you look at this, Cam Thomas and Mikael Bridges right now are the only 20 point per game scores on uh, the the Brooklyn Nets. Now you want to find a way to disrupt one or not both of those if you guys can play that level of defense to disrupt them both and that's going to help go a long way but a surprising player as well that I want to talk about in this while Ben Simmons has not been a scoring threat at all he's leading the Brooklyn Nets in rebounds and assists per game meaning he is still a major part of, of what makes that team go if you can get him off the boards it's going to go a long way with that but Ben Simmons is averaging 10 and a half rebounds per game and seven and a half assists so that is something you really need to zero in on uh, with this with this team if you want to kind of disrupt it. Only him and Spencer Dinwiddie are averaging eight, like he, he's averaging seven and a half. Spencer Dinwiddie's averaging right below five, and then you have Mikael Bridges averaging four. But the thing with this team is is the balanced attack of the of the Brooklyn Nets. Yes, they have two twenty point per game scores, but outside of that, they have eight players averaging in double figures on this team so far. What does that mean? that they spread the ball around. While they have those two guys doing the majority of the scoring load, as we've seen with the Chicago Bulls team, we are susceptible to allowing the role players to go off. And when you have role players that, again, not averaging world-shattering numbers or anything like that, when you have the ability to spread out that scoring like they do, Amani Brooks averaging 17 and a half, right? Lonnie Walker averaging 16.7. You got Finney Smith averaging 14. Cam Johnson averaging 12, Spencer Dinwiddie averaging 11, right along with, Tr with Trenton Wayford as well, a target that a lot of Bulls fans uh, wanted to see the Bulls go after with their last roster spot on top of that. So, again, you got you to gotta play solid team defense at every level against this Brooklyn Nets team. And while they're only 2-2 two and two on the season, they still play into a lot of the Bulls' weaknesses, and that's where we start seeing this team, uh, the Bulls, get exposed in certain areas. And this is another t dangerous team from three-point range. Right now, they're making 14 and a half three-pointers and shooting them at a 41% clip, good enough for top five in the league in both categories. The Bulls' three-point defense, which we've seen be pretty solid throughout stretches, we've only really seen one game in which the three-point defense was amazing for the whole game. That was against the Indiana Pacers. The Bulls are going to have to lock in defensively as well to avoid that three-point shooting uh, killing them. And so let's hope that the Chicago Bulls can do that, right? I know I just laid out a lot in a, in a condensed amount of time, but that is the keys to the game for the Chicago Bulls against the Brooklyn Nets. The first game of in-season tournament play for the Bulls. And we get to see that new fancy red court with those uh, questionable city edition jerseys. I love the story behind the jerseys, but the jerseys themselves is mad mid to me. But hey, that maybe that's just me. Now, when we're talking about the players that are important on this team, we already know what the core three, we, we know what they need to do every night in and night out. And it really comes down to those other two starters and what they give the Chicago Bulls. Most Bulls fans, being included, are kind of giving up on Patrick Williams as a starter right now, not necessarily in his career, but maybe, just maybe, starting Torrey Craig, maybe the move this uh, this game. We'll see if Billy Donovan changes that starting lineup. Now, one player I don't expect Kobe, I mean, don't expect Billy Donovan to change in that starting lineup quite yet is Kobe White, even though some Bulls fans are asking for it. Listen, I told you guys during the offseason, I wanted Javon Carter to take that starting point guard position, but Kobe did. And so I think you don't want to, five games into the season necessarily change that for the Bulls yet, right? But it seems like Billy Donovan's pretty confident and, and also that Kobe White's finding his voice. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and play this now. There are many arenas where we actually get to sit this close again, or still, but so to actually hear Kobe, you guys have talked about his voice. He's a, he doesn't soft talk guys either. He, he seems to have really kind of found 
how he's going to talk to guys, and it's not with soft hands. Is that good to see that he is taking that role, and there's not he doesn't seem to be you know backing down from letting guys know how he feels or what he did wrong or what they did wrong. I think the the, the thing Joe is like I think I mentioned to you maybe you asked me a couple games ago <laughs> about like his voice is because of his contract. Uh, I, th- we, I haven't had we yeah. Didn't get to hear Exactly. I think I think a lot of it is the relationship he's built with those guys. You know, he's been with Zach for a period of time. He's now been with Zach and with Vooch and Demar. I think Vooch and Demar have opened themselves up to say, "Listen, hold me accountable too." You know, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, and and that makes it easier for younger players. But I think Kobe's invested into the team, and I think when someone's intentions are all about the team and all about winning, it's hard to second guess. Now, if you got a guy out there that's just selfish and is not going to help on defense, put his body in plays, and now all of a sudden he's starting have a big voice and he's not doing the physical things like everybody's going to make mistakes but it's more like the intention and I think because Kobe's developed good relationships with those guys it, it puts him in a position that he can do some of that and as you heard from Billy Donovan there like he just talks about how the relationship that Kobe White has built in with that core three has allowed him to be more vocal and those players to really respect his voice right and I think when you're trying to develop a player and you're trying to have a player grow into a role that's very different from what they've been playing you don't necessarily pull them when they're having struggles if that if that core three is listening to them. Yes, Kobe White has struggled as a starter. It's not been as good as what it looked in the preseason, but there still have been flashes there. He's starting to understand how, where to use the speed, and how to use that speed as well to break down the defense and get passes to other players. And I think if you go into this thing, and I know Bulls fans were losing games, and it's fair, right? But when you go into this into this area that every time a player struggles, you want to just pull them, You don't really allow that to build confidence. And that is something that we've talked about with Billy Donovan and the lack of player development for years. So, you know, if Kobe's growing in that role, growing that voice, so to say, that that he said in that clip, I would like to see Kobe learn and go through these struggles, right? We we saw before, even when Kobe was on the bench, he started off sometimes with bad shooting, which last season was bad shooting overall, but he worked his way into finding and being able to contribute in other ways. This is a very different role for Kobe White. And I talked about on yesterday's episode how you know, the plus and minus with him and DeMar on the court have been have been less than stellar as far as those two guys on the court together. But you want to give an opportunity for Kobe to try to. I, I think the Bulls go about 10 games before we see major changes to the starting lineup um, outside of P. Will. Even then, I think P. Will may last that amount of time as well. But we'll end up seeing. I, I like to hear that Kobe White is growing in the ways that we need him to grow. And we'll see if that actually ends up coming out on the basketball court with improved play over time as he grows into the role as the starter. But, all right, with that said, let's move off that topic. Let's move into one that's interesting. So we heard that the Philadelphia 76ers were interested. They had Zach Levine as one of the players, him and OG and Anobi, of players on on their list that they wanted to add to this team via the assets they got, right? And we talked about during that that the assets really didn't match what we've heard, uh, that they have interest in Zach Levine. Well, we now have heard uh, that adamantly the Chicago Bulls, this comes from Joe Cowley uh, from the Chicago Sun-Times. He says this, the Bulls have no intention of trading Zach Levine anytime soon. So right there, shutting the door. And I think that that's where the Bulls sit right now, right? Is that they're not looking to make any trades right now. Despite some Bulls fans calling for full rebuilds, the Bulls right now, they're not looking to make trades. We can talk about at a later date whether that's the right or wrong move, but that's where the Bulls sit right now. Now, on top of that, it even adds this, but if they did, meaning that there's always a but, the 76ers do not fit the profile of what the team would seek in return for Zach Levine. Again, this is fitting towards what we've been hearing for this team for the better part of a year. They want two first-round picks, a young player, and salary cap filler back if they were to move on from Zach Levine. And the Philadelphia 76ers, considering in what they're trying to get, they're trying to add to Tyrese Maxey, and Joel Embiid. They're not trying to trade away any young players. And Maxi really presents the one young player that they have that I think most Bulls fans would agree the Bulls should be interested in if they were to trade Zach Levine. So all that saying, there's nothing to do, uh, much to do about nothing when it comes to the 76ers pursuit of Zach Levine. And that shouldn't really be too surprising for anyone, I would say. So, you know, it is what it is there. I'm glad that that's kind of come out. We can shut down those trade rumors. Let's focus on basketball. Now, with focusing on basketball, we're going to focus on voicemails so we can hear from you guys on this show. We're going to go ahead and play this first voicemail. This one is from Ron. Yo, what's good, Hayes? It's your boy Ron. I'm a New Yorker. I know it's kind of crazy having a New Yorker call in and talk about the Chicago Bulls. But I have a lot of stuff to say, right? So, first of all, Billy Donovan, as you all know, is terrible. I hated Billy Donovan since he was in OKC. 
I used to watch a lot of OKC games because I was a Russ fan, and I hated him even back then. His his rotation is terrible. Zach had 49 going to the fourth quarter, and I understand and we're down, right? And I understand that you want to give him some type of rest, but ride the hot hand. Let Zach start that fourth quarter off, ride the hot hand, and go on from there. But he takes Zach out in the beginning of the fourth, right, when he was our only offense the whole entire game, right, and they go down big time in the beginning of the fourth. Then he puts Zach back in within seven minutes, and at that time he's trying to play catch-up arrow ball again, trying to get the will of the team back in, and he calls a he, – he did a little bit too much in that fourth. He got a little couple of turnovers, stuff like that. But it's it, Billy Donovan rotation is terrible. I don't – like, he doesn't make sense. At, and I'm a basketball coach at that, too. And his subs, at the times he makes the subs, doesn't make no sense at all. You're playing five defensive players out there, which is DeMar DeRozan, who is an elite scorer, but – it is a one-dimensional mid-range scorer, and then we have nothing else going on, and we get in def- deficits like we did in the Pistons game. Then we have Vucevic, who's not – we don't see no type of plays at all being run for Vucevic for him to catch the ball on the block. We've seen this him catching the ball at the top of the key, handoff action all the time with Zach and DeMar, and it's fucking terrible. It's, it's, it's terrible basketball. Like like you said, there's no off-ball movement. Why is Zach – one of our better catch and shoot um three point shooters. Why is he always got to create off the dribble to get his three point shots up, or he just wide spot open, wide open look, right? Why we can't get no ball movement with that coming off some stagger screen, some up screen, some down screen, something. Let's like I don't understand Billy. Like everybody's just stand still. No one does no type of off ball movement, no type of um pick and roll um off ball picks or anything like that. All we have is is Handoff action and pick and roll, high screen pick and roll from Vooch. Why is Vooch not coming off of screens from the left side, from the weak side to the strong side on the to get a post attempt at all? Also, another thing I want to talk about that was ironic. Billy Donovan's ro- – listen here, man. Listen, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Billy Donovan's rotations are always questionable. And every time he has a game where it's a pretty solid defensive rotation night or, – or, or player rotation night, I said defensive rotations, where there's a pretty solid uh, rotation night, um, it always follows up with two or three games of, of just questionable rotations. Questions of when you take out certain players, the combination of certain players that you have out there. I will say this. Billy Donovan's been better at it this season overall than I think what he's done in any of his Bulls tenure so far. But there's still, a, especially in important games and close games down the stretch, there's always that head scratch and rotation where it's like, why are we making this move now when somebody's cooking? Or why are we making this or pulling this player now when they just scored a couple of points and seems like they're, co- they're starting to get out of maybe a slump, right? And that's the thing with Billy Donovan, right? The, the rotations and adjustments are always going to be one of the biggest flaws for Billy Donovan. Just It just is, right? Every coach has their flaws. Rotations and adjustments are always going to be Billy Donovan's. He does some good things. And like, while I'm not a Billy Donovan guy by any stretch, I will also admit that he does some good things and has been this year. Game play, we're getting wide open threes. We're just not hitting them. We don't have the personnel to hit them, but we're generating wide open threes, right? The, 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 uh, the renewed focus on going to Vooch in his proper areas. That's been way, way better this season than what it was. First two games, it was a bit rocky, right? But the rotations and adjustments are always going to be a problem for Billy Donovan. That doesn't mean every single game he's going to have some games where he does have good adjustments down the stretch. The Toronto Raptors game is one of those. But there are some times where it's going to be more times than not where you look at Billy Donovan and at the end of the day, you see those rotations and you're just like, man, what are we doing, bro? What are we doing? And that's just it, man. And so. Listen, Billy Donovan, much to your point, I don't think is the coach for the Chicago Bulls. I'm going to maintain that. He's the coach that we have now, and, a, and more, more likely than not, he's going to be the coach that we remain to have for, for the future. It just is what it is there. So um, you know, the contract extension hasn't kicked in yet. I know how cheap this team is. I don't necessarily see them moving on while that contract, that they would have to pay that full extension regardless if they fire him or not. So that's kind of my thought process on it, but let's hope I'm wrong on that one. But let's go to this next voicemail. This one's from the 708. Hey, hey, how's it going? I love the show, man. Uh, I hope you continue to uh, restart them in the, within the Chicago Bulls community on your YouTube channel. Wish the best luck to you, brother. Uh, but I had a quick question. And it's really in terms of Chicago as a whole. 
what, what is going on with our sports teams, man? I mean, I, I just don't understand. My problem with the Bulls in particular, we really haven't had a guy that we've drafted that's been considered the number one option or, you know, the best in the league since MJ. I mean, Derek had his moments, but it didn't last very long, as we all know. I mean, and, and the other issue is that why can't we seem to ever draft guys, develop them, make them top ten players, or get any free agents to Chicago? Chicago is not a small market. It's a major market, and I just don't understand. We haven't been able to get to draft guys, and they become like a Shea Gilgis, Gilgis Alexander or get big-name free agents like you know, Anthony Davis in the past or or guys like that. Uh, I just don't – or, you know, Kevin Durant or something like that. We haven't been able to draft guys and make them into a Draymond Green, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson duo uh, trio. I just don't understand. Why do we have such a lack of being relevant? I mean, essentially, um, we've been kind of in medi- mediocrity for a while now. And we just haven't had an opportunity, uh, or we just haven't done our due diligence. Maybe we haven't done our homework in the front office to be able to prevail in that area. Why can't we get any free agents, star free agents to come here? And why can we consistently never produce guys that become top 10 players? I want to know your thoughts. Appreciate it. Have a good day. What's wrong with Chicago sports team? Ownership is a big part of it. I think we see ownership groups in almost every Chicago sports team, especially the Bulls and the Sox, which are owned by the same person. Where it just it's not really that pride in winning and doing that that thing of I will do whatever it takes to win a title. Jerry Reinsdorf just isn't that type of owner. He looks at the business aspect of it. So much to your point, for a team like the Chicago Bulls, to them to get to that championship level, it's going to have to mean that they're going to have to draft extremely well, and that is something that we have not seen. Right? We 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 have pieces that we can see some potential in. Julian Phillips, I still am hugely high on his potential. Um, Kobe White is really growing. He's probably the one player, like you said, that we've kind of developed, but we haven't developed a star here in a long time. Zach Levine was a player we acquired via trade, right? Laurie Market, and we sent off before he was at, he, he got to that point, and we ruined his confidence as well. Thanks to shout out to Jim Boylan on that. But that is the biggest problem, right? And you look at in sports, there yeah, there are some teams that are able to buy titles. There are absolutely some teams that are able to do that. But for the most part, you either have to draft or develop a piece that brings the other that either brings the other stars here or is so good that then you 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 it makes it easier in how you fit teams around them and right now we haven't done that and that is the big thing we have not drafted a number one option even for this team we have nobody that we've drafted over the last five or six years looking at this team that we can then say if Zach left if Demar left and Vooch left this is a clear number one and a piece that we can build at least a playoff team around going forward we don't have that piece and that is what holds franchises back and that's why. AK and Eversley, I, I commend them for the player development department. Commend them. And I know a lot of Bulls fans are, but we we brought in a shooting coach. Why aren't we shooting better? It takes at least two years for a shooting coach to really work with players before you're going to see a big-time uh, change in that. But outside of the player development department, we have to start drafting better. We have to. Said this over on the members-only video I did with uh, Quentin from Let's Talk Bulls. The fact of the matter is, and I'm not, again, not, I'm just being real. Had we drafted Walker Kessler instead of Dalen Terry, or had we got either Devin Vassell or Tyrese Halliburton instead of Patrick Williams, this franchise would be in a completely different place. I'm not even saying doing both of those. One of those moves going a different route would have completely changed the outlook of how of how you view the Chicago Bulls team. Not to say that Devin Vassell is a number one, but he's a, a player that you can least, you, you, like he would fit this big three better, right? This core three better. And then if you did draft Tyrese Halliburton, um, over Patrick Williams, at that point then, you you do have a number one that you can build around, right? At a position of need at that, right? So those things always play a part in it. And draft is always going to be a woulda, coulda, shoulda. It's always usually told in hindsight, and unless you're the team that gets that player, you're always going to look at it as, hey, we probably could have done better. But we have to stop being on the other side of that. We have to get one of these picks right soon. We have all of our own first round picks outside of 2025. We have to improve in our draft and how we have to hit on a guy that's going to turn into a diamond. We have to, sooner rather than later, if we want to really become that team that can be a contender. Let's see if it happens, man. Let's hope so. But that's my time for today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central. Make sure you're following the show at Bulls Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns, bullscentralpod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail, like you heard on today's episode, Saturday and Sunday are the mailbag. 
The number to do so, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related, thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on. Go Bulls. Love you guys. See right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Break, break, media. media.